which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great, thy matchless, and thy holy name. Father, we thank you so much for being able to be present here this evening for this worship hour. We thank you for all who are gathered here. We pray your blessings upon those who, because of illness, or perhaps traveling out of town or not able to be here. Bless us, Father, as we worship you, we humbly pray in spirit and in truth. May your blessings be upon the leaders of our congregation, be upon Sydney and Anne as they labor here with us, be upon the leaders of our country. And Father, we pray that we as citizens of our country would live our lives in such a way that we might be able to influence those whom we elect to help us as a nation, Father, to return to the straight and narrow to return to once again being a nation who believes in you and who strives to do things as a nation that would be right, that would be honorable, and that would be pleasing to you. Father, we pray to that end. Bless us tonight, Lord, as we worship you. We thank you for the songs that Martin is leading us in. We thank you for his talents, his ability to so lead us. Father, we thank you for this good country in which we live. We regret, Father, that some of our young men and women are in harm's way in various parts of the world, even as we speak. Bless them, we humbly pray, with safety and a speedy return to their loved ones. And bless those loved ones who are here waiting and hoping that they won't get that call or that visit, indicating that that son or daughter has been injured or even killed. Father, for all the good that we have, we thank you for a measure of health that enables us to be present here tonight and to carry on the activities of our lives on a daily basis. And Father, we pray that we will never forget that all good and perfect gifts, and we have many, come from Thee. Bless us, Father, and forgive us when we don't use these gifts You've given us in a righteous way. And help us to grow that we might better use those things you give us for our benefit. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. I freely admit that I don't understand why he had to die, but I guess it's because of the sin that was in my life and in the lives of all who are within the sound of my voice. Forgive us, Father, for those sins. Forgive us for the way we've conducted our lives in times past and perhaps even now. That's not according to thy precious and holy will. Forgive us. Bless us as we strive to live each day of our lives as you would have us do. We thank you for that son who gave his life, and it's in his precious name 
the name of Jesus, your Son and our precious Savior, that we pray. Amen. Number 211. 211. Where stands a rock on shores of Sing this is an invitation to him after the lesson this evening. Two, one, eight. We stand at turn number 327. 327. The beautiful robe so white.
some strange reason, we have a lot of kids here tonight. Happens every year about this time. Just kids come in off the street for something. I told Ann this morning we were sitting up here and, and you, you could just hear the little chatter of the children here and there. I said, man, it sounds like 40 kids back there. But you know, I'm glad we have those sounds, aren't you? And sometimes when, you know, children get upset and they can't be calmed down, they need to be taken out. And I understand that and you do too. But just the little chatter here and there that, that children are going to do is long as it's not distractful, is a wonderful sound because it tells us that there's a future. There's a future. And so I'm grateful for all of the children. I love children. I know they'll have a good time after our services tonight with the trunks of treat. It is good to see each of you here, those who are visiting with us. We're delighted that you've chosen to be here, and again, we do have a number of visitors with us. In our study tonight, I want us to think about some things that I've just put under kind of a broad heading of change. When we think about this, this concept of change, we know that, that there's much said about change. And we try to emphasize that there is change that is good and there's change that's bad. We need to be able to distinguish between the two. In the church, for example, we talk about change agents. And we refer to a group of people whose agenda it seems to be to lead us away from the divine pattern that God has set for us. I think back to the time of the Reformation and Restoration Movement. And many of the battles that were fought during that time over principles of truth. And seemingly many of those battles were won at the time. But now some people seem to want to go back and reinstate some of those things that were not according to the pattern, things that were discussed and defeated in debate that helped us to have the New Testament church in its purity and in simplicity. Now we're getting away from that. We understand that. Yet, when we look at the Scripture, we understand that the Scripture demands some change. The right kind of change, if you please. For example, in Acts chapter 2, we have the occasion of the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. Peter on that occasion, or at least he standing up with the eleven, began to speak, speaking to those thousands of people who were gathered there, devout Jews, out of every nation under heaven. His particular sermon is the one that's recorded for us in the New Testament. And he begins by talking to those Jews. Let me freely speak to you, he said. You by wicked hands have taken and crucified the Son of God. That was his basic message. Because of the rejection of Christ by the Jews, his death came about. Because of the, the desire of men to follow the ways of unrighteousness, his death was a necessity. And so on that occasion, Peter to that group gathered there because they were at that point ultimately responsible for his death, said, you are responsible. And he come, you come down about verse 36 of that chapter and he said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, Luke records, they were pricked in the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins 
Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received the word were baptized. And there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. But when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say? Repent. What does that word mean? Well, we often define repentance as a change of mind that results in a change of action. Repentance is something that, that goes on in the heart, in the mind of man. And we decide that, that we're walking in the wrong way and we want to, we want to change that course. And, and out of that change of mind, we change our course. So basically what Peter was doing in, in Acts chapter 2 in that lesson was calling upon the people of that day to change. Well, we'd have to conclude that that was a good change, wouldn't we? That they would repent of being responsible for the death of Christ that they would change and begin their, to live their lives in harmony with His will. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, He uses that same word again on another occasion when He's speaking, Repent ye therefore and be converted. The same idea. So when we begin to look into the Bible, there are, there are certain times when change is, is necessary. But at the same time, there's some who just simply refuse to change. Even the good changes that need to take place. Matthew chapter 13, for example, and in verse 15, Jesus said, For this, we, this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. What's Jesus say? He simply says there are people in this world. There were people in His day, there still are. People in this world who don't want to look at the Bible. They don't want to look at God's Word. They don't want to hear you when you're trying to teach them God's Word. They don't want to see God's Word, because they simply do not want to change. That's what Jesus is saying right here. It's not something that has happened to them that, that has prevented them beyond their control from seeing and hearing and understanding. It's just a simple matter that they don't want to see. They don't want to hear. They don't want to understand. And you and I know that whenever you run across somebody like that, they're not going to hear, see, and understand because they don't want to hear, see, and understand. And it's just like talking to that wall there when you try to talk to them. So while there is change that is good, that, that we're called upon to make, some people just simply refuse to make that change. But what I want us to do tonight in our study is, is look at some of the changes that need to be made. Some areas of, of good change, if you please, where we need to really look at ourselves and see if there's change that we need to make in our own lives and especially in our heart. And that's our first point. In some cases, there needs to be a change of heart. A heart that is not properly guided, according to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, is a heart that is deceitful above all things. How often have we heard people talk about and, and even make the statement, let your conscience be your guide? That sounds good on the surface. But if the conscience has not properly been taught, it cannot be a proper suitable guide in things that are right or wrong. I've talked to people through the years, and you probably have too. Who would, in, in the process of, of teaching them about changes that, that need to be made in their lives, would say, well, I, I didn't realize there was anything wrong with that. I've never heard that before. 
That's not that they were intentionally trying to do anything wrong. Their conscience just had not been properly taught. So they were not bothered by the fact that they were doing something wrong. You know, Paul would be a good example of that, wouldn't he? When he said, I've lived in all good conscience before God under this present day, Acts chapter 23, and later on in that same letter, he said, I thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Christ, but he did it in a good conscience. And so when a man's heart, a man's conscience, is not properly taught, it can be deceitful. I think about the statement in uh, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seems right, seems good. But if the, if the heart has not been taught, then it can be deceitful above all things. So in chapter 10 and verse 23, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct its own steps. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about that heart that is fully set to do evil. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. And the occasion of the people of this world Immediately before the flood, every thought, imagination of man's heart was evil continually. That pretty well describes what, what Ecclesiastes 8 is all about. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul, as he is describing the, the Ephesian brethren before they became children of God, and he talks about how they walked according to the course of this world. How they followed the prince of the power of the air. How they walked in their own lust. But once they were taught the truth, once they understood the difference between right and wrong, they began to follow that which was right. And, and so when we follow that which is wrong, we sin against God and that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. And as a result of that, whenever we live that kind of life, we then have brought ourselves under the wrath and the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 1, after Paul has talked about the gospel being the power of God to save, he begins to discuss people who are not so influenced by the gospel. And he continues that right on down through the end of the chapter. But he begins the section in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Then you come over to chapter 2 and in verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart. And what does that suggest? Remember we talked about repentance a moment ago? Change of mind that results in a change of action. What is this concept of impenitence here? Here's a person who's not willing to listen. Here's a person who's not willing to, to make those changes that are necessary. So, so out of that hardness and impenitent heart. Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now that doesn't present a very pretty picture, does it? If we're not willing to make the changes necessary in our lives to be in compliance to the will of God, then we have brought upon ourselves the wrath of God that will be manifest in the day of judgment. At which time, incidentally, it'll be too late to do anything about it. In John chapter 12 and in verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Ezra chapter 7 and in verse 10. An interesting statement with regard to this prophet of God. Ezra prepared his heart. Now, actually, there are four good points in that verse. 
Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it. Four excellent ideas, but where does it begin? Ezra prepared his heart. And so when you begin to to look throughout the scriptures, you learn that, that actions proceed from the heart. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So what does he say? You look at that list of sins, and he, he in essence says, every one of those comes from the heart. So then you begin to understand why the proverb writer said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so that says to us that if our heart is not right with God, then we need to get it right with God. Repentance, change of heart, is a must. And there are a host of passages there that you can read through. Luke 13, you're familiar with, verses 3 and 5. Jesus said, I tell you nay, that except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So a change that is absolutely necessary, if it's not what it ought to be, is a change of heart. But then in addition to that, there's what we might refer to as change in character. Change in character. By this, we're simply suggesting that, that once there is that change of heart, then there's going to be evidence of that in our lives. You look back at the section in Matthew chapter 3, and you'll be familiar with it. John was baptizing um, as he was preaching, and he was saying to the people, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you'll notice down in verse 8, after, well, look at verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. It's interesting the marginal reference there on that phrase, meet for repentance, is answerable to an amendment of life. So when there is that change of mind, there will be an amended life that will be evidence of that change of mind. That's change in character. Peter talks about the same kind of thing in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 11 and 12, when he said, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So there has to be that, that change of character. Whenever an individual has that change of heart, there's going to be a different life. We understand that hopefully from the standpoint of, of being baptized into Christ. That's where it all begins. Romans chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not? That so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In that same chapter, down in verse 13 he says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of, un of unrighteousness of sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. There's a deliberate choice that we have to make, that we're going to live that different life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 17, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's different from the way we lived our former life. Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's that newness of life. So there's the change of heart. That's obviously a good thing. There's a change of character. That's obviously a good thing. But then there's also a change in relationship that is good. For example, there needs to be that change in our relationship to the world. In 1 John 2, 15 to 17, John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, pride of life. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. And so, so there is a call to us out of, that, out of that purity of heart that we now have. Out of that desire to change our way of life, there's going to come in a change in our relationship to the world. We're not going to love the world anymore. That's why, as we just noted in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world set your standards for you in that regard. You see, we're now a child of God. No longer a child of the devil. No longer a child of the devil. In 1 John 3 and verse 1, I love this verse, in which John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You know, if some way we could just get that one verse to soak in a little bit, I think it would make a difference in the way we serve God. What manner of love the Father bestowed upon us. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but out of His love and mercy and grace, He makes it possible for us to be His children. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul talks about, uh, if you go back to, to the first part of chapter 1, he's writing to the church at Colossae, those who are in Christ. Then you come down to verse 13 and he talks about those same people who've been taken out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. There are only two kingdoms of which one can be a member. The kingdom of the devil or the kingdom of God. And you can't be in both at the same time. When we choose to have that, that change of heart that brings about that, that, uh, that change of, of character, it's going to affect our relationship because now, now, we're going to be children of God as a result of that. Translated into the kingdom of his dear son. First Peter chapter 2. Peter talks about that holy people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Somewhat of a, de of a description of those who are now children of God. A holy nation can't be said of people of the world. I, I think we understand, hopefully we understand, how this expression has been used through the years to talk about our nation as a Christian nation. It has not been a Christian nation in that the nation as a whole has never been following the will of God. But at least there were certain principles that were followed that would have a tendency to bring one a little closer to God if they'd follow them. See, we're getting far away from that now. We're going in the other direction, and hopefully... Through our prayers and efforts, something could be done to bring about some changes. But we need to be children of God in Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. Where we have access to all spiritual blessings that are in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful relationship? To be able to, to, to turn away from the world, be a child of God, be in Christ, have access to all spiritual blessings. We see it begins with that change of heart that results in a change of character that will bring about this change of relationship that we have a right
to enjoy. But then what about change in purpose? When we think about good changes that, that need to take place in the lives of a lot of people, certainly I believe this is one of those good necessary changes, change in purpose. What is our purpose? Well, coming out of this relationship that we just talked about, a child of God translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, we now find ourselves on the Lord's side if you please, in the Lord's army. It's amazing how many passages there are in the Bible that talk about fighting. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. And all of those passages that we can mention in that regard, and, and many of them we have at this particular point. But notice what Jesus says. You're either for me or you're against me. One of the things that you'll find in just a, just a basic study of the Scriptures is that there's no neutral position when it comes to spiritual matters. You look at the two ways, no third option. You look at the two gates, no third option. You look at the two masters, no third option. You look at the destinations, no third option. You look at the ways, no third option. It's either or. And so Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. So we are either in his army fighting for the cause of Christ or we're still on the side of the devil. That would be serious, wouldn't it? We need to change our purpose, begin to fight. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about those pieces of Christian armor. This change in purpose, our purpose becomes one that is characterized by love and mercy and compassion. You know, we talked about this morning in Hebrews chapter 12 and the encouragement that we gain from, from those uh, characters coming out of chapter 11 that we run with patience the race that's set before us. In that same context, in verses 11 and 12, 13, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, let it be rather healed. So what's he saying? There's need for discipline. There has to be discipline that's exercised. But, but out of that, we lift up those feeble knees and the hands that hang down. You know, that's one of the things that we've been trying to emphasize with our CHD activities. We're trying to encourage. We're trying to show that, that love and compassion that God's people are to have one for the other. The more we portray that, the more that is a, a part of us, the greater impact is going to, you know, if you, if you treat people like you don't care, you're not going to have a very, very good influence on them. And that love and concern and compassion is not to be fake. That's hypocrisy. But out of genuine love and concern, we reach out to people. And that's, our, that's at least one of our purposes in that regard, fighting against the devil in that regard. And so in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Our change in purpose would include bearing fruit for God. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, Paul says we're dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even him is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You know, back during the 70s, 60s and 70s, I remember when there was a great emphasis on personal evangelism, personal work. I went to a lot of workshops in that regard. 
And almost without exception, you would hear this statement. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. That was the plea. That was the, that was the drive that was given to us to, to get out and reach out to other people. But I want to suggest to you that the fruit of a Christian is a lot more than that. When you look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and following, you find what is referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of a Christian. Love, joy, peace, so forth. Yes, we need to be winning souls for Christ. We, we need to be reaching out to those that are lost. But to make the statement based on Romans 7, 4 that the fruit of a Christian is another Christian is to miss the entirety of that context, in my opinion. The fruit of a Christian is far-reaching, far more involved, inclusive than that. Change in purpose. When we continue on with this idea, it will involve leading others to Christ, as we just mentioned. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way even unto the end of the world. This change in purpose will also involve glorifying God, and that's done in the church. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Now unto him, that is God, be glory. Where? In the church. By what means? By Christ Jesus. How long? Throughout all ages, world without end. That would just seem rather strange, wouldn't it? To the ears of those who would tell us that the church is not important. When that is the very place that is designated whereby glory goes to God in the church. And if I'm not in the church, I can't give glory to God, that being the case. That would seem to me to make the church rather important, make it necessary. And there are a lot of other reasons, but certainly that would be one of them. In 1 Peter chapter 4, down in verse 11, you're familiar with the first part of that verse. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. But in the same verse, that God in all things may be glorified. That's our purpose in life, to glorify God. Not to build up self, not to bring honor and glory and praise to self, but to glorify God. You think that wouldn't make a, a change in the way we live our lives? If every decision that we made in life was designed to bring glory to God? Well, you know it would. A great change that could be brought about in the lives of all of us. As far as that change in purpose, it would also involve being set for the defense of the gospel. Paul makes that statement in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 17 that he's set for the defense of the gospel. I was going to read you an article. I have a rather lengthy article here, but time's not going to permit that I read it to you. But it, it's just um, it's rather revealing of some things that are happening in the Montgomery area. Some of the churches down there that, that no longer have a distinctive plea, swapping pulpits with whomever, inviting whomever to speak in their programs, and so forth and so on. A lot of changes are taking place. But one of our purposes needs to be that we are set for the defense of the gospel. In conclusion then, we think about all of these changes. And as we've suggested, change is not exclusively bad or good. There are some changes that are terrible. But there are some changes that are admirable as well. We need to advocate and allow only those changes that are authorized. And these that we've talked about tonight are certainly authorized in that regard. So when you think about change, and especially in view of things that we've talked about tonight, do you need to make some changes in your own heart? Sometimes we sing a song, I don't think that's what we're about to sing, Is Thy Heart Right With God? That's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question. Is thy heart right with God? 
Do we need to make some changes in our character? Do we need to, to make some changes in our relationship? Is our relationship with God what it ought to be? What is our real purpose in life tonight? Does it fit the mold that we've discussed or do we need to make some changes in purpose? All of these are good changes that certainly we would encourage in the lives of those who need to make such changes. Tonight, if you're in this audience and you're not a child of God or you're one who has, has wandered away, we certainly would encourage you to make the changes necessary. We've talked about first principles briefly, especially from Romans chapter 6, the need to be baptized into Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. That, of course, is preceded by faith in Christ as the only begotten Son of God, turning away from sin, being willing to confess that faith. Child of God who's done that, you've, but you've wandered away. You've, you've had a change of heart. You've had a change of character. You've had a change of relationship. You've had a change of purpose. You need to make some good changes tonight. And get back to where you need to be through prayer and repentance and confession of the wrong in your life. If we can encourage you to do that, we want to do it. As we stand together and sing the song selected. Thank you for everyone that's here tonight, especially those that may be visiting with us, for everyone that had a public part in our worship assembly. We're certainly thankful for your efforts as well. Remind you of those on our prayer list, Marilyn Intrican, Jan and Joyce's mother is now at home and she is slowly recovering. Jane Cox is to have surgery this coming Wednesday, the 29th of this month. J.W. Gray continues at room 241 at Higgins Hospital here in Bremen. Joan Thurman fell and broke her leg this past week, and she is at Tanner Medical Center in Carrollton, uh, room 270 now. They've had to put some screws and plates and so forth in her leg. She's not doing real well. She'll probably be uh, at Tanner for some time in rehabilitation, but I'm sure she'd welcome visits. So again, she's in room 270 at Tanner in Carrollton. Also, Richard and Shirley are not feeling well and are both at home today. remind you of several events that we have upcoming here at uh, Bremen Church. The church picnic is upcoming next Saturday, November the 1st. It will be at Camp in Agahee for those that are willing to help cook, bring your grill and be there about 3 o'clock. There's a sign-up list in the foyer if you would be so kind as to sign that so we can kind of plan. The, the uh, meat and the buns will be provided but those who are willing to bring some of the uh, fixings, if you would, please sign that list so that we'll know what we've got. But again, uh, if you want to help cook, be there about 3, and we'll eat about 4. 
Also, the Ladies' Thanksgiving Day Luncheon is November the 8th. There's a sign-up list in the foyer concerning that. And also the hospice event, there's a sign-up list in the foyer for that also. So please check those out if you're willing to help in those efforts. Also, um, many of you may remember we were fortunate to have visits last week from Marshall and Martha Flowers. They brought a bunch of books that uh, Brother Marshall has had for some time, and he donated that to our library. So since the time has been busy of late cataloging those in our library, but um, we'll have some specific announcements as to what those books entail. But some of them have been in his possession for many, many years, and he's been so kind to donate those to us. So uh, we've sent him a thank you note uh, in those in, in connection with that, but uh, again, we're thankful for the flowers and all that they mean to us and the many books and commentaries that he donated to the church here at Bremen. Any special instructions concerning trunks of trees? Okay. So after we dismiss, those who need to get into uniform may do so, meet out in front of the church building in a small group or something that we can corral. We don't want nobody to get too close to the road. Obviously, safety is the most important thing that we wish to stress, but there will be a signal once everybody's ready, once you're in the front of the building, we move out here and then gather all the loot. After that, everyone else is invited back into the fellowship hall. We'll have a fellowship in the fellowship hall after uh, the activities in the parking lot are complete, but it will be on this side of the building only, okay? Lord's Supper is kept prepared in the library. It's in the fellowship hall, okay? For those that wish to observe the Lord's Supper, it's been kept prepared. Once we stand and sing, go through this door, second door on the right, and down the hall, there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service is Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our midweek Bible study. We hope to see each of you at that time. Should we mention anything else? Final song. 145 is our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Now Let's bow our heads. Dear most and most gracious Father, thank you for this, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us once more to come here and worship you. We pray that our worship this evening was acceptable in your sight and pleasing to you. Lord, we pray for anyone who is sick or who may be in need of our prayers and help us to continue to remember to pray for them. Lord, go with us this upcoming week. Help us not be conformed to this world, but be the holy people that you would have us to be. And may we be Christian examples to others. Lord, may we bring glory to your name in everything that we do. Please, Lord, thank you for this food that we're about to eat. May it nourish our bodies. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.